if m of z is analytic in the complex plane, take away the contour, so it's analytic in each of these sectors, m plus of z equals m minus of z times v of z on sigma. Now, m plus or minus is the limit as z prime goes to z plus or minus, I'll explain it, of m of z prime. So if I'm sitting here, m of z is defined out here and defined out here. m plus of z will be the limit as I take z down, z prime down to z from the plus side, and m minus is the limit of m prime of z as z prime goes to z from the left. So m is a solution of the Riemann Hilbert, a k by and in, in by k if it satisfies these. So sometimes people call this a matrix fa factorization problem. Because if you take v, v here, v will be equal to m minus in, inverse times m plus, so you've factored the matrix in some way. Okay. Now, if n equals k, so the matrix m is square, we say m solves the normalized sigma v if m of z goes to the identity as z goes to some normalization. Now, I'm going to write down now some of the analytical issues which one faces with Riemann, with Riemann Hil uh, Hilbert problems. There are a ton of them, and I'm not going to, there's just no time to go through it in any systematic fashion. We'll just deal with them as they come up. So these are some issues, just to get you thinking about it, which arise. How smooth. Any contours that you can put in? Secondly, uh, what is the measure theory? Or function spaces? Points of self-intersection. So if you've got a point like this, what do you how do you understand what's happening at that point? What do you mean by m plus and m minus and things like that? Okay. Uh, the sense of limits. So m plus and minus are limits as you come down to the con contour from one side to the other. In what sense is that limit being taken? And in, in, in what sense is m of z going to the identity? Okay. Does a solution exist? case. Is the solution unique? 
and most importantly, So this is something which as analysts you want to get your hands on also there. So what kind, uh, kind of a problem? And I'll tell you what the answer is, and we'll soon see. It's concerned that a Riemann-Hilbert problem really is equivalent to the analysis of singular integral operators on the contour. So singular integral operators. Singular. on the contour. And these will typically be Fredholm operators. So in the end, if you ask what kind of a problem, it means you're looking at singular Fredholm integral operators. All right. Uh, so let me spend some time now, or the remainder of the time, explaining how things actually work. How do we see? these Riemann-Hilbert problems coming up in what we've been speaking about. So we'll go back to our <coughs> panel of A2. So this is an example. Pan of A2. Now there's a very nice book brought out. I mentioned by Fokas Itchen Kapayev and Novak Shainov, who will, uh, from which you can learn a great deal about uh, the Riemann Hilbert problems associated with Pan, pan of A equations. And the references are all written down. So you lo look at six rays, sigma k, which is equal to rho times e to the i k minus 1 times pi divided by 3, k running from 1 up to 6. Here is sigma 1. Sigma 2, sigma 3, 4, sigma 6, and sigma is the union of these things. And attach and you orient these curves outwards. And on each of these contours, you're going to put down the jump matrix. 1, P, 1, P is going to be a constant. Here you go, 1, 0, 1, Q. Here you've got 1, 0, 1, R. Here you've got 1, 0, 1, P. At 1, Q, 0, 1, should be up here. And finally here you have 1, 0, 1, R. So you've got six jump matrices, and they satisfy this relation, P plus Q plus R plus P, Q, R is zero. So these are three numbers satisfy this condition. Now fix X, any co complex number. Theta, zero, zero, e to the i theta, 
v of z e to the i theta, 0, 0, e to the minus i theta, and theta is equal to 4z cubed over 3 plus xz. Thus, for example, on this contour over here, you would have v of xz, so on sigma 3, you would have that vx is equal to 1, 0, 1, r, e to the 2, i, theta, for example. Now, let mx of z solve the normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem, sigma vx. So there are you, so m is going to be analytic in six sectors, and it has these jumps across here. Then the, that means that m of x will look like the identity when z becomes large, and we can write here its uh, next term And then the astounding fact is this. If we set y of x or u of x equal to 2i times m1 of x, 1, 2, this solves term of a2. So there you begin to get the picture. We've got a collection of lines. We've got jump matrices across there. We find the solution of the normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem for every x. We evaluate the residue term in the solution. We take its 1, 2 entry. We multiply it by 2i, and we obtain a solution of pan, pan of a2. So you've got a representation. The issue is, what can you do, do with it? The answer is that there is a version of steepest descent similar to the, in, uh, the cl classical case, which will enable you to evaluate the asymptotics. So let me show you what the as asymptotics looks like. So this Riemann-Hilbert pro problem really goes back to the Japanese school, of Sato, Miwa, Mi, Mi, and Jimbo, and also in this country by Flaschka and Newell. And you find the following. Let's take a specific case. Zero. Then as x goes to minus infinity, ux is equal to root 2 nu over minus x to the quarter times the cosine, cosine of 2 thirds minus x to the 3 upon 2 minus 3 upon 2 nu times the log of minus x plus phi. This is plus order log of minus x upon minus x to 5 quarters. And nu is equal to minus 1 upon 2 pi times the log of 1 minus q squared. And phi is equal to minus 3 nu log 2 plus log of the gamma function of i nu plus pi by 2 sigma q minus pi by 4. So I'm writing this out so that you have a very clear view that you are obtaining similar precision that you obtained in the case of the airy function you now obtain 
for the solution of this nonlinear non e equation pan, pan of A2. And that's obtained, instead of using an integral representation, you use a Riemann Hil Hilbert problem and you apply a nonlinear version of the cl classical steepest de descent method to obtain this. There's a similar for explicit for for formula when x goes to plus infinity. And you can read off, if you know the behavior at plus infinity, you can immediately read off the behavior at min minus infinity. So this sets the, stan the standard for what, one, for what one wants. Now, I want to say a little bit now, again, about the modified K KDV equation. Maybe I have enough time to actually write down what plus infinity. This is again for this solution of pen and pen of A2. And this is equal to Q I X. Very simple. So you see that if we know the behavior at plus infinity, that means we know Q. Once we know Q, we can compute nu. This is a gamma, a gamma function. And hence, we can compute. We've got the signal. You've got everything here, which means that we know exactly what the behavior is as x goes to minus infinity. Conversely, if you know the behavior as x goes to min minus infinity, it means you know nu, which means you know q squared. But because you know this solution as x goes to minus infinity, you know phi, which means you know also the signum of q, so you can recover q. And hence, you can plug it into that other side, and you see what the solution looks like at plus infinity. Okay, let me say a little bit now about the Riemann-Hilbert problem for modified KDV, the equation we started start off with. And now, again, the contour sigma is just going to be the real line going from minus infinity to plus infinity. And for x and t fixed, We define Vxt, which is going to be a two by two matrix function on here, which is going to be given by one minus r of z squared minus r bar e to the minus two i tau. Here it's going to be r of z e to the two i tau. Here is one tau as this form, plus 40 z cubed. And r, which is called a reflection coefficient, and you should think of it at this stage as being in one-to-one -one correspondence with the initial condition Uh, this is the initial condition for MKDV. So MKDV, uh, I remind you, am I getting that yt minus 6y squared yx plus yxxx is 0, and y at x and t equals 0 is this function y0 of x. So the, in fact, there's a scattering problem associated with y, y0 of x, and that gives you a reflection coefficient r, and the, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between r and y0. So if I know y0, I know this function r, and if I know this function r, I know 
y, y zero. But here is the jump matrix. And we let, remember x and t are frozen, be the solution of the normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem, sigma, which is r, vxt. So m of xt is asymptotic to 1, and there's an a residue term as z goes to, to, to infinity, then u x t is equal to 2 times m1 of x t to 1. So that's again this truly remarkable fact. So let me just say again what you're doing. You fix x and t, and you build this matrix. And this is the, a reflection coefficient, which is equivalent to the initial data for the equation. You solve this normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem, getting function. You look at its residue term when z gets large. You take its 2, 1 entry. You multiply up 2. That's the solution of the, of the modified K, uh, KDV equation. If you can analyze this Riemann-Hilbert problem asymptotically when space and time, x and t, become large, you have then got your hands on the long-time behavior of the solution. Part of that behavior that you get, as we saw in this region here, this is x, this is t, so I'm freezing at time t. I'm looking at well, here we had Panlevé. And this region here is of length. x is t to the third. That's that region. Somewhere out here, it looks like a modulated sine solution. And you can describe what the solution looks like everywhere using these te techniques. Just a little word, which will set our direction, is that just as in one of the main features of the classical steepest de descent method is deformation of con contours. We picked a, con a contour, you remember, going to basically the 120 and 20 degrees up and down, but you then can deform the contour by co Cauchy's theorem in such a way which is ad advantageous for the, uh, for, the st uh, for the state stationary phase analysis. In exactly the same way, there's a deformation procedure for Riemann-Hilbert problem. And to show the connection how pan, how pan two is going to come into the solution, because we said over here, the solution is going to be pan pan How does this Riemann-Hilbert problem have built into it or hidden it in it? Pen, pen of A. And it comes out in the following way. And we'll see more about this later. Is that in the case we would be writing out here, when Q was between 1 and minus 1, and R was 0, if R is 0, that line isn't there. So you've got a Riemann-Hilbert problem. So P plus Q plus P plus R plus PQR is zero. So these drop out because of that. So Q is just minus P. So you've got a Riemann-Hilbert problem left on something like that. This is for P in pan of A2. But for MKDV, You've got a Riemann Hill problem just on a line. Now what you do is that you take your jump matrix 
and you'll factor it into two pieces. I'll say more and more, more about that later. That enables you to deform this problem here into a problem on lines looking like that. In other words, this piece is going to be associated with this line, this piece is going to be associated with that line. And then if you just rotate this around a bit, you begin to see this contour coming through, just to give you some idea. So let me just end with the following remark. The way I've motivated Riemann-Hilbert uh, Riemann problems is their use in analytical theory. I want to know what the solution of KDV or MKDV or the NLS equation looks like when X and T becomes large. I want to know what this pro probability distribution looks like, uh, say the gap pro probability, that there are no eigenvalues in the gap when that gap gets large. Those are analytical problems. But Riemann Hilbert problems are also useful in other con uh, contexts. So, not only, let me just finish off with this. So we've, speak, we've spoken about the analytical uses. But there are also algebraic uses. In other words, Riemann-Hilbert problems is a canonical way in which they give rise to other differential equations which are of interest. Sometimes in the physical community called string equations, also other things. It also, it's purely, uh, uh, so I should put here, rather than that, I should really put asymptotic. But now this is going to be purely analytical. So, as I say, I've motivated this by speaking about uh, asymptotic issues, but you'll see that riemann hilbert problems are also useful for algebraic purposes. And finally, also for purely analytical issues. For example, there's something called the Pandave property, which uh, distinguishes the Pandave equations from all other e e equations. How do you prove that a Pandave equation is in the pan pan levee class. A little bit like Gerard's question to Ivan, when is, K is K K KPZ in the K KPZ class? You can do this by using the riemann hilbert problem. That's purely an analytical use. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for a beautiful lecture. Are there any questions? So how do you know that there is a Riemann-Hilbert problem associated with the problem of interest? OK, now that is this whole question in all, all of mathematics. It's really, uh, let me phrase your question like this. Once you know that the problem has a Riemann-Hilbert representation, you know that you can sol solve it. So the question is, how do you know a priori that a problem is sol solvable? There are many different partial answers to this. If it has this property, you'll be able to, if you have this. But the real answer is that it's really just hit and miss. That is the real answer. Uh, uh, people who feel that they can write down a systematic procedure, which was some sort of Galois theoretic point of view, which will tell you when you can solve, uh, solve a problem, and particularly when you can write it down. Uh, but I don't believe it really cuts the mustard. In the end, you just have to be lucky and if you're lucky, you should use it. I have a short question. So are the contours always fixed in this riemann hilbert problem? So you can also study what's happening when you kind of deform these contours? Absolutely. I mean, de deformation is a fundamental part uh, of the technique, of the uh, technique. And in fact, uh, it's essential to get bounds, which will be independent of how you deform the contours, uh, just as in the cla classical steepest descent method. Are there any other questions? <coughs> if no, then let's thank first again. Okay. <laughs>
And we'll be